Hey, how's it going? Welcome to the 3030 challenge week two. Hopefully you're doing 30 minutes a week. If you're an adult, you got way more time, go for it. Do more. If you got little kids, you know, probably going to take the whole 30 minutes. Hopefully you can go more in the future. You get their kind of the routine down. But today we are starting to talk more about our 3030 challenge. And uh, we are going to be moving on uh, in what we had discussed. And uh, we're going to be going through, you know, the new city catechism. And uh, so here is, um, here's the, here's the book. Uh, it's new city catechism and I've got it right here in my hands. Uh, we're doing day two. Now, let me just say this. If you're watching videos and you're watching this one and you're watching when I do these ones, um, you'll notice that a lot of the questions are very sim similar. Here's why. They're both catechisms. Uh, this is put out by Baptist. This is put out by Gospel Coalition. This is a little bit, um, uh, this one is definitely for adults. Uh, this one is for, um, for kids. This one has 200. This one has 52. And so there's some overlap. In fact, today and probably next week's are going to be a little overlap, but there's some different nuances in how we're going to talk about them and how we're going to answer them. So um, today's question that we are going to deal with is going to come from uh, this one right here, uh, which is what is God? Okay, so what is God? Uh, maybe for you, you have kind of thought um, this through. Maybe you've seen the last video if you saw uh, the way we answer that for our children's one, kind of a boiled down version. Um, but have you ever thought about what that means of what is God? Have you ever thought about, um, you know, who he is and what that means? I mean, because really how you answer that question is important. So when we talk about God, uh, a lot of people have different answers for what they think God is. Uh, as I'm going through the devotional, which is a great book, great read, uh, it's the devotional, it's the companion to this. So if you really like going through this one, um, you probably want to do this because uh, it's going to take me 52 weeks to go through this one. Uh, but one of the things he talks about, and I love that they say, this comes from uh, New Testament theologian D.A. Carson as he's writing about this stuff. Um, here's what he says. I, I love this line. He says, um, just because someone uses the word God and then somebody else uses the word God, uh, it doesn't follow that they mean the same thing. For some, God is an inexpressible feeling, or it's the unmoved cause at the beginning of the universe, or it's a being full of transcendence. But we're talking about the God of the Bible, and the God of the Bible is self-defined. Now, I think that's a really important point that Carson makes, uh, because really, you can think all that you want about what is God, um, who is God, uh, and so what do you mean by that? So when we talk to people about God, this is important because in our culture today, we have a lot of different views about what God is. Some say, well, I don't believe in God, but I believe in a force of some sort or the universe. And to them, that is their God. They, they kind of define it as that. Uh, for others, you'll say, well, I believe in a God. And then what will happen is God is a list of things that they like. Um, and so they'll say, yeah, but you know, my God who I serve would never do these things. Well, okay, that's all great and all, but, but is your God based on the God of the Bible um, or is he based on what, what you think? Now I'm talking primarily, I'm talking to Christians in this regard because uh, for a Christian, uh, you, you have to define our God based on the way he defines himself. Uh, there is no room for you to say, well, I feel that my God wouldn't do these things or that, right? Uh, that's not for us to do. A lot of people in circles want to claim that God would be for this or God would be for that. And, and before you can even get there, you must base it out of Scripture. You must. You've got to come to the point where you say, well, because I've seen God do this, this is where I land on that. But we have a lot of feelings-based approaches to God today. Uh, a lot of ways that people will talk about him will be, this is, well, I don't want to serve a God who is, who is judgmental. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I, my God is a loving God. He would never send people to hell. Okay, these are all things that we want our God to be. But the truth is, if we dig deep, uh, a lot of the time, the, those statements that we might hear, or even maybe you've used, Really, those come close to breaking the, the first commandment. 
Uh, you'll have no other gods before me because that's not the God of the Bible. You've created a God with pieces of what the God of the Bible, but you've made him look something completely different. So let's look at how the question is answered, right? Uh, what is God? And so here's how New City Catechism uh, asks that and answers it. God is the creator and sustainer of everyone and everything. Now think, let that, let that set statement sink in for just a moment, okay? God is the creator and sustainer of everyone and everything, okay? That's a pretty profound statement, right? He created everything. He sustains everything. Your breaths that you take right now, the reason I'm not dead right now is because God sustains everything and everyone. Now, notice the next thing that he says in here. He is eternal and infinite and unchangeable. So he's always been. He's infinite. He is, will always be. Uh, he's, you, you, there, there's, not, there's no limits to who he is. And unchangeable. He doesn't change in his power and perfection and goodness and glory, wisdom and justice and truth. Now, think about that. He doesn't, he's infinite, he's eternal. Those are big, big concepts. He didn't have a beginning. He's already, always been. That, that is so important to grasp. You know, people say, well, where did God come from? Well, God doesn't need anything because God in and of himself is all sufficient. He doesn't need anything. He didn't, he didn't come out of somewhere. He's just always been. He is eternal and infinite. And then that next thing says this. He's unchangeable in his power and his perfection, and goodness, and glory, and wisdom, and truth. God doesn't change. He will always be as powerful as he ever, he's ever been. All powerful. He'll always be all perfect. He'll always be all good. He'll always be all glorified. There's, there, when you talk about the glory of God, he, he, all glory is due him. That's what you see in the Bible, where when you encounter God, you have no choice but to fall down and worship because of how incredible he is. He'll always be all wise. He'll always be all just. You know, I was reading in my own quiet time in Genesis about uh, Abraham and talking to the Lord about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham keeps trying to figure out, like, what would be considered just? He said, God, you wouldn't burn it down. You wouldn't destroy it if it was 50, right? And he goes, because you're a just God. Yeah. And, and then he's like, oh, well, maybe, maybe there's not 50. I think they keep going down. And so Abraham has in his mind what it, what it just should be. And, and God is a just God. And you find that out, that God was willing to even keep this city if it just had just a few individuals in it. And so you see that he's always just, even though we may not fully understand how it works sometimes. And the deeper you go in the Bible, you begin to see that relationship between justice and wrath and justice and love. Uh, and then he's all truth, always. Uh, he doesn't change. He doesn't lie. He doesn't change his mind. Uh, those are deep, deep things that we think about God. Notice the last part of this thing here. It says this. It says, nothing happens except through him and by his will. Now, that's a pretty deep concept to think about, too. Nothing happens except through him and by his will. Um, when you understand that, that God is in control of all things. God works all things. Everything is within his power. Now, there's this thing. If you go a little bit deeper, think about what that line means. If God is truly in control of all things, there is something that we will talk about. And you go a little bit deeper and you think about that. But how is it that I have my freedom to make decisions that I make? And sometimes I make terrible decisions. And yet God is in control of all things. God is not actively pushing me to make me do those things. And yet in his own control, those things can take place. Uh, but it's, it's interesting, as you see, even in the Old Testament, um, that even these terrible things that take place, God has a way of taking all of those and controlling them and making them work into his own plan. Uh, he is in charge of everything. Uh, one Bible teacher I love listening to, and he's passed on, is R.C. Sproul. And Sproul used to say, uh, there is no such thing as a, a maverick molecule in our uh, existence, meaning that God is in control of it. There's, there's no chance for anything to thwart God's plans or thwart something where God is out of control. God is completely and in control of everything. Now, those are really, really tough and deep concepts, and I hope that you have some time thinking those through. Do you believe that? 
Because when you read the Bible, this is the view that we present is that God is those things, um, that there's no getting around that. That's how he defines himself. And I know for some of you, it think, wow, that's, that's really kind of difficult to grasp. It should be because he is God and you are not. To understand that God could be all these things and do all these things and, and, and be, as we see, creator and sustainer and, 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 and keep everything moving. That's important to, to really try to figure out. Uh, and it's hard to figure out completely. I, I love the verses that we find here in the text uh, that they give us. They give us Psalm 86. And just look at some of these. Lord, there is no one like you among the gods, and there are no works like yours. All the nations you have made will come and bow down to you, before you, Lord, and will honor your name. Think about that. There's no one like you among the gods. There are no works like your works. The, the, the writers of the, of the Bible are saying there's no one, there's no fake God who even comes close to being like the God of the Bible. And, and one day, all the nations will come down and bow before him. All of those ones that worshiped other gods and the few, those people who came out of those ones one day will come and bow down. Now, that's important to see because in the Bible, we do have a picture of, of two ways people will bow. Those who have, who have trusted in him will then bow, and then those who have not will still be forced to bow at the, at the ruler that we see, Jesus, in the end. Um, for you are great and perform wonders. You alone are God. Now, that's important. There is no other God. It's just the God of the Bible. And then he goes on to say in verse 15, but you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth. I want you to think about this too for just a second. Those are words written about God from the Old Testament perspective. And I think sometimes as a Christian, you might have, a, uh, you might have the tendency to say, well, you know, the God of the New Testament is a little bit different than the God of the Old Testament. Uh, God of the Old Testament is, is kind of mean, and, and God of the New Testament is kind of nice. And But when you read words like this, notice how they talk about it. You are compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth. Um, this is the way that the Bible talks about him. And if you don't quite understand why God did what he did in the Old Testament, it's probably because you haven't read it close enough to see that God was slow to providing uh, what they really truly deserved in the Old Testament, um, that, that God was all just in what he did uh, and how he acts. But I love how the Old Testament describes him, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in faithful uh, love and truth. And so let those things sink in. The God of the Bible we have is unlike any other God. Your God that you might build up in your mind, you can't even compare to the God that we have in the Bible. And so the question is, do, do you worship God as he has seen in the Bible? Is that God or is it something else? And so begin to think about this and ask God to help him provide you an accurate view of who he is as we see it unveiled in the scriptures. That is all I've got for you guys to, right now. We will talk to you later. Thanks for watching.